Welcome to Glenda Blasts Your Ear Off, flash fiction stories written by Josh Bush and narrated by Glenda Villamar. Enjoy! You have 1,440 minutes in a day. Use five of those minutes and visit freerice.com to play trivia games and help end world hunger. Freerice.com If you would like to donate to help support the podcast, you can donate at coffee.com. That's ko-fi.com. And you can also buy our ebook anthology, compiling the stories from our first 10 episodes. You can find our book on lulu.com. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. Episode 20, Net. One. Mallory tried her best to pretend that she cared about whether or not the Raches would enter into the trade agreement. If the Lionels got the Raches to agree to trade with them, then some rich people would get richer. And if the Raches didn't agree, then some rich people wouldn't be as rich. Ota cocked her head at Mallory. Am I boring you? You don't seem to be listening. And Mallory cursed inwardly. No. Ota asked incredulously. No, I'm boring you, or no, you're not listening. Mallory answered, You are not boring me, and I am listening. Well, you're listening now, at least. So as I was saying, this is important, and that's why we can't wait for an escort. I need to be on the scene yesterday. That woke Mallory up. Wait, we're going to go alone? Just us? You can't be serious. The risk is too big. You're too valuable to the Lionels. Mallory couldn't think of many scenarios where Ota going off on her own could be disastrous. They'd be so vulnerable. They could be attacked en route by any ship, and if they found out who Ota was, anyone could get hold of her for ransom, and the Lionels would pay handsomely to get her back. Sure, Ota cared about money and power, but unlike most of the ruling class, Ota cared about the people, and they loved her for it. Ota shook her head. I don't care if it's risky. We need access to the Rach's worlds. I mean, if we're allowed on them, then there's going to be so much money to be made for our merchants. Mallory picked at her teeth and asked, Are these profits worth putting yourself in danger over? Ota put her hands on her hips. Yes, they are. Just think of the taxes we'll get from the merchants' transactions. We could use that money to help our people, Mallory. Mallory shut her eyes for four seconds opened them back up, and said, I don't think us going without an escort is a good idea. But you never listen to me, so I don't even know why I bother to say anything, or why you even discuss things with me. You always do the opposite anyways. Ota smiled broadly, and it looked like to Mallory that Ota thought there was something funny in what she had said, but there was not. I discuss things with you because talking to you keys me into what I should do. If I do the opposite of what you recommend, then I know I'm making the right decisions. Mallory said deadpanned, I'm so glad you think so little of my view of things. Ota said conciliatorily, No, it's not like that. Your concern is always my safety. But you see, my concern is the people I serve. 2. Sway liked when something broke down on the command deck. It made him feel like what he was doing mattered more. Sway worked on an access panel in the back of the command deck. He'd taken the cover off the wall so he could get at the internal workings. He could see the clear pipes that were supposed to be running with dark red blood, but instead, the blood had turned a lime green. Sway was amazed at how much of the blood in the tubes in this part of the wall had gone bad. No wonder the staff on the command deck had been complaining about how their computers had been acting up. Sway got to work. He pushed up the sleeve of his coat, got out a syringe, and drew out some of his own blood. Sway had done this so many times before, he barely registered the prick of the needle. When he got enough blood, he pulled the syringe out, put on an adhesive bandage, and lowered his sleeve. Sway pumped his own blood into a tube in the wall. He lowered his work glasses over his eyes, and with the microscopic vision they gave him, he watched his blood mingle with the green blood. Sway tried to ignore the voices on the command deck. The others were excited about something that was going on, but Sway was intent on his work. He quickly saw what the problem was and programmed a fleet of nanodrones 
that would tag a ride on his white blood cells that were already attacking the spoiled green blood. The voices behind him were getting agitated, but Sway filled himself with calm so he could focus on the task at hand. He was almost done. Just twelve more lines of code. Sway didn't want to have to do this again. Almost. Almost. There. He'd completed the programming, and he watched with satisfaction as his drones piggybacked his white blood cells and started attacking the green blood, which turned from green back to red like it should be. Sway closed the tube connection, and only then did he allow himself to glance at what was riling up the command deck staff. And when he did so, all thoughts of putting the cover back on the wall vanished. On the screen, he saw ships, and that the stars weren't moving. Sway had been so engrossed in his repair that he didn't realize that the ship had come to a complete stop. Why had they stopped? Sway looked closer at the screen and saw something that didn't make any sense. Stretched from one ship to the other were yellow lines of light. There were more ships than Sway thought there were at first glance. The yellow lines of light formed a net. Sway wondered how it was possible that they'd gotten stuck in a net like a fish. Ota Lionel asked the room, Has anyone ever seen ships like these before? I've never heard of anyone having the tech to be able to pull this off. Mallory muttered, Told you we should have waited for an escort. Ota frowned at her and said, Not helping. If we had an escort, I'd bet they'd be just as stuck as we are right now. Sway was shocked to hear that they didn't have an escort. There were lots of ships out there. Granted, they were small. Tiny, in fact. But there were lots of them. At least twelve. One of the staff bellowed, They are messaging us! Here it is! Sway saw a figure on the screen. It was an alien. It was a diminutive humanoid with blue skin, and its skin looked like a lizard with rough scales. It stood upright, but hunched way over, and the alien rocked from side to side. It said, You are trapped in our net. Your ship is ours to do with as we please. If you want to keep your lives, then you will do as I command. Ota waved at the screen and said, I'm Ota Lionel. Nice to meet you. With whom do I have the pleasure of speaking with? The alien sneered. My name is Nat Schnaders, but why are you talking when your leader is behind you? And he pointed. Sway, in disbelief, saw that everyone turned towards him. Why would Nat think he was the leader here? All he could think of was that it must have something to do with his size. Sway had been born a little person. Ota motioned for Sway to come to her. Sway couldn't believe this was happening. He was just a technician, and one who no one ever paid any attention to. His supervisor saw to that by always taking credit for Sway's work, and by giving him the duties that no other technician wanted. He had been lucky to be assigned to the command deck today at all. Sway ambled forwards and stopped at Ota's side, and she said, "'My apologies, Nat. This is our leader, Sway Ashta.' And Ota bowed to Sway." Sway was surprised that Ota even knew his name, let alone his last name as well, and that she bowed to him? Sway felt like he was in a dream, so he decided to act like he would be in a dream. I'm Sway. You have made a great mistake here today. We are a mighty warship that's heavily armed, and I should know because I service the weapons daily. It's one of my daily chores. Ota cleared her throat, and that reminded Sway that he was supposed to be pretending to be the leader. If you don't let us go, then I won't hesitate to use our full arsenal of weapons against you. Nat's eyes bulged. An arsenal of weapons? Now that I like the sound of. I'm coming over to talk with you, Sway. Prepare your airlock. And Sway gulped. The screen went black. Ota said to Sway, That was good. Not exactly how I would have handled it, but good work. The question is, can you keep it up, Sway? Sway shrugged. Why not? This feels like a game. I can keep playing the game. Ota said severely, A game that can result in all of our deaths, Sway. Now come with me, so we can discuss what I want you to say. 3. Sway sat at the head of the long table. He tried not to appear nervous, and also tried not to glance at Ota too much. Sway looked at the congregation of blue aliens around the table. All of them held little furry creatures in their arms. The creatures looked like sloths. Sway asked, Why do you have those furry things in your arms? And Ota groaned. Nat answered, These are our clith dogs. Sway wondered aloud, 
Why do you bring pets to a negotiation? These are more than just pets, as you say. We are cold-blooded creatures. Our cliff togs provide us with warmth. And this is not a negotiation. I'm here to tell you what you are going to do. On the way over, I thought about how I can use the arsenal you were bragging about earlier. You're going to use your weapons against our enemy. Sway liked playing pretend. Before he went to bed every night, Sway came up with scenarios like this and did the things in his daydreams that he could never do in real life. But here he was. And he was more than prepared to be the person he never got to be in real life. Sway squinted his eyes. What do you mean? Why do you want me to attack these enemies of yours? What did they ever do to you? Nat explained. We all used to be in the same generation ship, but a year ago our enemy mutinied, and in the process they destroyed half of the ship. In order to escape with our lives, we fled the generation ship with these smaller ships that surround your ship now. Our enemy has resources that we need, things that we can't get anywhere else than from them. Sway asked, Did you ask them for help? Nat grew indignant. Of course we have asked. They are not interested in sharing. Sway asked, What do you need from them? We're running out of almost everything. Food, water, oxygen, fuel. All the technology required to make those things are in the generation ship that our enemy possesses. Sway said, Then in that case, I will help you. And Sway knew he'd said the wrong thing, because Ota put her head into her hands, so Sway quickly came up with a plan B. But not in the way you think. Nat oozed menace. Oh, and what exactly does that mean? It means I can get you the things you need without having to use my ship's weapons. I can give you those things. Nat cocked his head. You just give them to us? Why? Sway sat up. Because it's the right thing to do, and because if I do, you will let us go. Nat growled. It's not that easy. Our enemy has the technology to make the resources over and over. Once we use up the food, water, oxygen, and fuel, we'll be right back to where we started. Sway smiled. In that case, I'll just have to give you the machines that can make those things, and when I do, you'll let us go. Sway glanced at Otai out of the corner of his eye. She nodded her approval. Nat took a while to think and eventually said, What's to stop me from taking these machines and adding your ship to my fleet? Sway stood up and banged the table. Because if you don't let us go, then I'll use my arsenal of weapons to destroy you. Then Nat stood up. You won't be able to destroy all of my ships before we destroy this ship. Sway chuckled. Maybe, maybe not. But if you destroy my ship, then you won't get those recourses you so desperately need. Not from your enemy or from me. Sway was so alive inside. He wished he was this bold in real life. But this was real life. And here he was being bold. You will take the gifts that I'm giving you and you will let us go. Do I make myself clear? Nat walked up to Sway and stared him down. Sway tried not to move a muscle. He knew if he showed weakness, then all would be lost. Nat put a hand on Sway's shoulder, and he said, I respect you. I accept your counteroffer, and upon receipt of your machines, I will let your ship go. Nat took his hand away, smiled, and beamed, Your people must be proud to have a leader such as you. Ota walked up and said, Yes, indeed. His people are proud of him. The End Thank you for listening to today's episode. We look forward to bringing you the next episode... And Glenda blasts your ear off.